much. Um, so yeah, I'm actually probably going to be bridging the discussions we had earlier before the tea break and Martin's paper, providing a case study from the Scottish coast. So um, just to start off by framing the issue, um, Scotland has a very long coast. It's twice the length of England and Wales combined. It's the second longest coastline in Europe. Um, of course, the coast has always been a preferred area for settlement. Um, so it's very rich in archaeological sites, but it is a very dynamic environment. Um, there's a lot of uh, change happens there very rapidly. Well, a lot of our coastline is suffering from erosion, uh, coastal processes are impacting on sites, lots of our coast is suffering from rel- relative sea level rise because of our history of glaciation, and with climate change and increased storminess, these issues are only going to get worse. So the coast is facing some serious problems in Scotland. So to illustrate that, I'm just going to take us to Ballyshire on the west coast of North Uist. So there was a perception um, in the mid-20th century this coastline was eroding very rapidly. So they undertook a mapping exercise, mapped the coastline in 1946, that's that purple line. In 1992, they repeated the exercise, mapped the coastline again, that's the blue line. As you can see, it actually hadn't changed very much in nearly 50 years. However, there was a very big storm in 2005, you might remember it. In one night, this happened. They lost up to 50 metres of coastline. An entire archaeological site gone, one event. So uh, it's not just the West Coast, it's not just the Atlantic Coast that's suffering from these issues. We're going to go to Brora on the East Sutherland Coast now to show you another example. So this was a site that the local community spotted. When they first spotted it, this is what it looked like. A couple of weeks later, that's what it's looked like. After the big southeasterlies in the winter of 2012, that's what it looked like. Fortunately, because they were very interested in it, they had a a real plan for the site. We were able to get in beforehand, do an excavation, and at least rescue the information from the site before it was completely destroyed. So that's the issue that we're facing. So in recognition of this, uh, Historic Scotland, as they then were, they're now Historic Environment Scotland, uh, they set SCAPE up, uh, Scottish Coastal Archaeology and the Problem of Erosion, in 2000. It was really in response to the issues that uh, Scotland's coastal heritage were, uh, were facing. So our remit is to work with the public on uh, the archaeology of the Scottish coasts, especially that which is under threat from coastal processes. So um, SCAPE's undertaken a number of projects, um, notably Shorewatch, it was one of the first ones. Uh, it was a very successful project. It was so successful that the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society stole the name. Um, it undertook a number of projects, but the real emphasis was on, on monitoring sites. The idea was to work with local communities to locate, record and monitor coastal archaeological sites. Uh, For the past four years, since 2012, we've been working on the Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk Project, SHARP. This is all about employing the citizen science approach, or the structured volunteering model. It really is a natural progression of our philosophy of working with the public on coastal archaeological research and management, because it's a national problem, and we're providing a national resource, but looking at it through a local lens by working with local communities. Because local people, they're on the coast every day, they have that knowledge and expertise. We provide that national perspective, that experience and knowledge of archaeological projects. Sharp really is all about a mechanism to access that that local knowledge and bring it to decision makers. Of course, we're not working in a vacuum. It builds on Scape's philosophy. It builds on previous projects like Shorewatch, as well as um, projects like we heard about yesterday, such as, as TDP. So we've, we've learned a great deal from these other projects. So SHARP is in two parts. The first part is called Shore Update. This is uh, the, the part that really um, starts the, the citizen science crowdsourcing um, model. So um, there was a series of coastal assessment surveys carried out by professional units around the Scottish coast. They've covered 35% of the coast. In that 35% of the coast, there are 12,000 archaeological sites. Following a prioritisation exercise, about 1,000 of those are deemed to be high priority, which means they're both vulnerable to coastal processes and they're important. Um, As with any data set, there were issues. Um, Following 15 years of data collection, that stack of reports was what we had. Um, And they were also rapid surveys. They weren't designed to capture local knowledge. They weren't designed to be in-depth surveys. Uh, So the resource really had an enormous potential that that wasn't being realised. So we wanted to do something with that data. We wanted to turn it into a tool for management. because these issues, as I say, on the coast are only going to get worse. So crowdsourcing really was an obvious direction for us to go in, given our philosophy. Uh, IT developments allowed us to put that data set online, digitise it, put it onto our website on an interactive map where people can access information about sites, they can download survey forms, then come back and submit their survey information and their updated records to us. Um, So 
This is really all about transforming the data into something that people care about. It's a very efficient way of updating, enhancing, and improving our data set and making that transition from data collection, which almost becomes something for its own sake, into something for, for management. It's engaging people, it's involving them, it's giving them a say in their own coastal heritage. And um, also with uh, the development of mobile technology, we've been able to develop an app which has all the same information as the interactive map on the website, but smartphones are all-in-one recording devices that people can use on the coast. They can submit their, their survey records uh, through, the, through the app as well. Of course, this has involved a lot of investment of our time in travelling to these communities, training um, people up in, in, in how to do the surveys. The real emphasis is on training people and using the technology and in the process of coastal archaeological survey. Um, and it's really about working with people, building that relationship, giving them confidence in, in their own abilities, um, providing support, starting to build that face-to-face -face relationship and, and that dialogue. Because people have opinions and they have information, but you need to invest in that relationship for them to share their knowledge with you. Uh, all of that is backed up with online guidance and resources as well. People can go on to the resources page of our website and access training on there as well. So after almost four years of SHARP, this is where we are. Uh, we've had 1,009 updated survey records submitted, uh, 461 new sites, that's the, the green dots are the, are the new sites that people have submitted, and 130 different unique individuals have contributed that information to us. So um, SHARP really, as I say, is it's a mechanism for channeling that local knowledge and local value of sites into local priority lists, uh, local action plans, and it's international policy as well. It's all about that, that transfer of knowledge and expertise and value from the local community to national decision makers. Um, uh, volunteer generated information, it really is at the core of our, of our data and that does require, as we've just been discussing, it does require a process of moderation. A lot of our staff time is spent on moderating that, that information that people are, are submitting. Uh, you, you, you really can't underestimate the, uh, the amount of time you spend on that. Um, because, and that's particularly important because not only are we using that data for our own purposes, for our own project outputs and documents, but we're also sharing it regularly with the historic environment records and with the national records as well. So it is, it is important that that data is, is accurate. And that, that, that volunteer data is, is going to go into not only a national snapshot of, of the state of the resource and into priorities and action plans, it's also going into management of these sites, future research and into action on the ground as well. And it's all really information that's been generated by, by members of the public. It's not just about the data though. Um, after four years of the project, we've got a network of informed, empowered, uh, knowledgeable, skilled citizen archaeologists who really are taking on the stewardship of their own coastal heritage. Um, I think what's important is beyond the formal end of SHARP is that we maintain those networks, um, maintain that support for them, so there's, there's still a point of contact for them to come to. And um, I, th I, th I think what would be quite nice to do is... Um, post sharp maybe in a few years time is, is repeat the exercise and start to generate time series data to really build up a picture not only of the state of the resource but how it actually changes through time um, because it, it, it is the, the volunteers really who are at, uh, at the core of our project our concept of community archaeology isn't just crowdsourcing it's not just asking volunteers to contribute their time and their information but we actually involve them in, in the decision making um, in terms of um, using community to find value to inform further follow-up work at selected sites because it's communities that decide the sites that we move on to carry out the second part of our project, shore dig projects on at, at selected sites. This is all about facilitating local ambition for further coastal heritage sites. So at the start of the project we made sure that we'd have the resources to um, take action at some sites which had been nominated by these local communities because I think it's important not just to monitor sites but actually do something to actually take action as well. Um, and it's also important in, ter in terms of widening participation too. So this is all about using community values to target the limited pot of resources that we've got for coastal heritage at sites that are, are locally valued. So um, over the past three and a half years, we've undertaken a range of different types of projects at a range of different types of sites. There's been varying scales. Um, some are very substantial projects in their own right. The one thing they all have in common <coughs> is that they were suggested by the local community. So I'm just going to show you a few case studies of the sort of work we've done. 
So uh, we've worked with a group of pilots called the UK Civil Air Patrol, who are pilots um, who uh, volunteer, they, they fly around anyway, and they've offered to take some fantastic aerial photos of coastal sites for us, which I think is really important because coastal and intertidal sites particularly, you get a perspective on them from the air that you just don't get in any other way. So they've contributed thousands of images, really high quality images of sites that you just would never see any other way. We've also done a project called 4D Weems Caves. The Weems Caves, if you don't know, are sorry on the um, <coughs> south coast of Fife. And uh, this is particularly interesting heritage. Uh, we undertook a suite of uh, digital data capture using uh, various different techniques um, because there are unique Pictish carvings in these caves. It's actually the largest single collection of Pictish carvings anywhere in Scotland, which by extension means anywhere in the world. Um, but these caves are facing a very um, wide range of threats. They're right on the coast. It is a coastline that's suffering from serious erosion. Um, the coast edge there is inherently unstable as well, so there's landslip issues. Um, it's an area, it's a former coal mining area, so it is suffering from um, issues of, of, of social deprivation as well. Um, that goes unfortunately, perhaps hand in hand with vandalism. Um, in 1987, a car was stolen, driven into a cave and uh, set fire to, which completely destroyed a number of these unique um, Pictish carvings. The good thing about erosion now is you can't actually drive a car up to the caves anymore, so that's mitigated that threat at least. Um, and also, even though you can't actually drive a car into the caves, they are still suffering with issues such as, as anti-social behaviour. So they are a really important resource, but um, to pick up on, on Cara's point, um, they're under threat physically, but they're also under threat because they're not being valued. There's a lack of understanding, perhaps like the, the ring here you were, you were speaking about, that they're not appreciated because people don't, don't actually understand how important the heritage they have on their doorstep is. So we undertook um, a range of different um, data capture um, techniques. We did uh, low-level aerial photography um, to generate models of the coast edge, uh, laser scanning, as well as photogrammetric techniques, um, RTI, um, photography um, and this has really helped us to visualize the caves to get for the first time a really accurate record of the caves themselves of the carvings within them and of the coast edge within which they are they're sitting um, and also for management this is the the well cave here and that sitting on top of it is Macduff's castle now there was a perception that the cave was likely to collapse which would take Macduff's castle with it and potentially compromise the entire coast edge so there was a plan actually to pump that cave which is full of Vic, um, Victorian carvings pump that full of concrete in an attempt to stabilise the, the coast edge. Um, they actually got as far as drilling a pipe through the roof of the cave. You can maybe just about make out um, the, the pipe that, that was drilled through. Um, that plan was shelved and as you can see from our uh, laser scan, it's just as well it was because there's actually an enormous amount of rock between the cave and the castle. So that, that castle's not going anywhere. Uh, we also did... Um, oral history research, local history research to capture more recent memories and perceptions and, and, and histories of the caves because they've been used right up to the uh, mid-20th century for, for various things by the local community. And all of that has been mounted um, online onto a website for D. Weems Caves, which is shortly about to be relaunched, um, which really does open up the, the heritage, not only of the Pictish carvings, but the, the local history use of that part of the coastline to a global audience, which will hopefully not only inform people around the world about the heritage, but also the local community as well. So hopefully that's, that, that stretch of coastline will start to be appreciated and we may stop suffering from some of the same issues as it, as it has been. Um, a different, completely different type of project. We've been looking at a boat graveyard at Loch Fleet and at Findhorn Bay. If you don't know where those are, that's Loch Fleet on the East Sutherland coast and Findhorn Bay on the Murray coast. So um, these were sites that were actually first spotted by volunteers when they were doing shore update surveys for us. They just spotted bits of wood on the foreshore and drew them to our attention. So again, we've uh, done a range of uh, different uh, recording techniques. So this is low-level drone photography, which um, has allowed us to take uh, thousands of photos, which we've been able to stitch together into a 3D model, which you can have mounted online on this website called Gigapan, where you can zoom right in to see in incredible detail these, uh, these features. We also did traditional on the ground um, survey methods, so photography and scale drawing as well. And uh, we've got a really good accurate record now by using all those different techniques of the physical remains of those boats on the foreshore, which were previously completely unrecorded. 
Again, we also undertook local history research and oral history research because a lot of the communities who use these boats are, are still there living, living locally. Uh, we're very lucky as well in that there's a fantastic resource of um, archival material about the history of fishing in Scotland. Um, so that's added a lot to our understanding as well. It really has helped us to pad out the story, what these boats were, how they came to be on the foreshore and really tell, tell the whole story. Because um, prior to our project, these boats were almost completely unrecorded archaeologically. There were almost tens of thousands of these vessels around the Scottish coast. Now there's four left. And prior to this, there was hardly any record of them at all in the national or, or the regional records. Uh, we've also done a project, something completely different again, down on Eyemouth Fort on the Scottish borders. This is a Tudor fort. It was constructed during the, the rough wooing campaign. And um, it, although it was an extremely important site in terms of the formation of the relationship between Scotland and England, and indeed on a European level as well, Scotland and France and England and Spain, it was completely, negle completely neglected, completely unknown. Local people didn't even know what they had on their, on their doorstep. Um, it was also suffering from erosion. This is sort of fairly catastrophic cliff failure we're, we're looking at here. So um, that's why the, the local community got us involved. Um, so they had um, real ambition for the site, the local community. So they came to us, they set up a community group, they developed a plan, they took on man management and maintenance of the site because with it being an earthwork site, just the physical amount of vegetation growing on it was a real barrier to interpretation and access as well. People just were not understanding the earthworks they were looking at when they walked past. They also commissioned a variety of surveys. Our friends at the UK Civil Air Patrol got involved and took a series of fantastic aerial photos. And just to underline the seriousness of the erosion, that bite out of the promontory is, is, is really fairly recent. There is a serious problem with erosion there, which is now um, getting into the, um, it, it, into the integrity of the monument. <coughs> Um, they've done a fantastic job of getting all the local schools involved as well. I think every school child in Eyemouth has been down on there. They've experienced the fort. They understand the importance of this monument they have in their village. Uh, there's an interactive museum um, exhibit as well, uh, which was launched with a living history event um, a couple of years ago. And they've just commissioned an on-site interpretation panel as well. So this is a really good example of a, of a local um, community group who had ambitions for a site and that they've really turned it around from being something that was completely unknown to a site that celebrated and enjoyed locally. Um, a very different project again in a very different site. This is RAF Wig Bay on the shores of Loch Ryan and the Solway. Um, this is a Second World War flying boat base, which again was really neglected. Um, so we undertook a condition survey of the actual physical remains of the site. Uh, we worked with uh, local disenfranchised, vulnerable young people to make a film about the heritage. So not only did they learn about the, the history on their doorstep, they also gained new skills in terms of uh, video making and editing. They um, met people from the area who they might not otherwise have met, people who remember the, the, the base when it was in use. And uh, those films are now online, um, bringing, again, this heritage to a much wider audience. And uh, it was actually really rewarding working with these young people because over the course of the week, we saw them go from people who just were not interested, were convinced it was going to be absolutely crap. And um, by the end of it, they were really enjoying not only the heritage, but the, the process as well. So it was a particularly rewarding one. Of course, we've also done um, actual excavation as well. This is Channerwick Brock on the um, south mainland of Shetland. So this is a site that was almost totally unrecorded prior to the winter storms in 2012. Um, after a particular storm event, the landowner spotted human remains eroding out of the coast edge. That led to a human remains call-off contract, and it was in the process of that work that... Um, the archaeological deposits in the section adjacent to the remains were actually flagged up. Um, so they were brought to the attention of us because it was an eroding site and also to the local archaeologists as well. And it really got people very, very interested indeed. So we went up there, we did uh, an exercise in recording the section, uh, small scale excavation and sampling as well. And um, we confirmed that it is in fact a broch, which was completely unknown prior to this work. And also, it's had a later wheelhouse inserted into it as well. And the nice thing about this project was the local group who really drove the project have then taken those skills they learned on this excavation with us and applied them to another site in Shetland, which is also eroding, which was another one of our priority sites as well. And uh, finally, we're going to go to the um, island of Sandy in Orkney, to the Muirburnt Mound. So um, 
This is a site again, it was spotted after the winter storms in 2005. Um, initially, there was a sort of stone box structure spotted on the beach, which uh, it was thought might be a, a kist. So again, it was dealt with initially under a human remains call-off contract. There's a team went up there, investigated, realised it in fact wasn't a, a burial, but was in fact a complex burnt mound. Um, the local community then, they were very interested in it, but after the archaeologists left, they were just watching it get battered every year by the winter storms. The site was being destroyed year on year by the, by the winter storms impacting it, and they had more ambition for the site than that. So they got us involved. We uh, went up there, were able to re-excavate the site, in the course of which we discovered a number of other features which the original excavators weren't able to, to get at because they, they quite simply hadn't had time. So... Um, we found a fire cell, which is right there in the, in the coast edge. That's where stones were, were heated in a fire. Rolled down the passage to this stone tank. That's the feature that was first taken as a possible kist burial. The hot stones in there were used to heat water from this well. The original excavation only had time to go down a short distance. They thought it was possibly a cistern. Um, our work revealed it's in fact three metres deep because it still contains fresh water. There's fantastic survival of organic material down there, uh, which has given us a whole um, new suite of evidence um, for the Bronze Age environment of, of, of Sandy. As I said, though, the local um, community had more ambition for the site than just to excavate it and then watch it be destroyed by erosion. Um, so we physically dismantled the site stone by stone. We transported them across the island. And uh, we built a reconstruction of the site, actually using as far as possible the original stones from the, from the beach. And um, not only does that um, give a new visitor attraction for the island, it's somewhere people can go to learn about the well, burnt mounds, about the Bronze Age and Sandy, about coastal processes, and it's left a legacy for the island as well. So it now has something that, that they can keep hold of, a tangible piece of, of their heritage, which is, which is particularly nice. So, over the past four years of Sharp and, um, well, 16 years of Scape, um, what, what have we learned? This is just a map of the activities we've undertaken over the past four years. Um, I think one of the key things about Sharp is that we are addressing a very serious need. The heritage is being lost. We're not just involving the community, we really need their help. Because there are those 12,500 sites, 1,000 of which are high priority. We really need help to deal with this. I'd say one thing we've learned is that it does take time to develop collaborative project ideas. Um, we were probably quite ambitious um, in, in terms of the number of shore digs, but um, we, we have been able to do it, but it, it has been, been hard work. Um, community groups do need support, they need training. Um, we have spent a lot of our time travelling to these areas, um, but I think the key is that support needs to be sustainable. It needs to carry on beyond the formal end of the project. And I think a key thing about working with communities is it's not easy and it's not cheap. And I think it shouldn't be done just to chase funding either. I, I, I think that's quite an important thing. It does take a lot of your time to travel, to build those relationships and, and work face to face with people. Because their data is being used not only for our purposes, for management, for research, it's going into the regional and national records, it does need a lot of quality assurance. Moderation does take a lot of your time. But I think it's important that you recognise and value and explicitly acknowledge the contributions that volunteers have made to the project. Um, and there's a discussion yesterday about um, the importance of integrating volunteer data with research frameworks. I think we've been particularly lucky with SHARP in the way it's coincided with the development of Scotland's archaeological research framework um, because SHARP started really just after that was launched and um, with the sort of reworking and, and, and revisiting of SCARF that actually ties in really well with our data analysis stage which I think has, has worked out really quite well. But I think what's, what's key to SHARP is that the volunteers really have been properly integrated into the creation of really good quality data that is going to go forward to be used for really serious research and for site management. Um, their data is being translated into policy, into documents and into actual action on the ground. It's not top down it's not bottom-up, I think it truly is collaborative. And um, although Scotland's coast really is facing serious um, issues, by working together we can start to begin to address them.